We would be remiss as a church if we did not uh, gather and proclaim the Word of God. So you have a preacher in front of you. I'm not just going to sit down and say, have a good afternoon. Uh, sorry about that. Actually, I'm really not sorry about that at all. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been to a family reunion? I, my, I love family reunions. Now, I'm not talking your, your standard, like, every year kind of thing before COVID, like the big family reunions. Like when you've got people, generations you haven't seen in years and years, you've got great-grandparents who have never met their great-grandkids, that kind of stuff, right? Great-uncles, cousins, all that. What is that noise, that scene like, at least the first couple hours before everybody gets mad at one another? Right? Like it's a scene of joy. You get people who've never met, who have nothing in common besides the blood they share, telling stories, some true, some a little exaggerated, some just off the wall. It's pure joy. There's laughter, there's songs, there's singing, there's tears, there's all kinds of emotions, but really it is pure joy. It is pure joy. Now, a lot of people think joy is happiness, and joy is not happiness. The definition of joy, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Now, in the circumstance of a family reunion, what is that possession that you desire? It is these relationships that you value. It is the good fortune of loved ones gathered around, the, the realized promise of being together. But here's the thing about joy. All of those things, well-being, success, good fortune, possessing what you desire, are all impossible without some preconceived notion of what it is you're expecting, right? You cannot have joy with what you experience if you didn't know what you were expecting in the first place. Have you ever had a moment in your life that was totally over and beyond anything you could have imagined? Anyone ever had a moment like that of joy? Right? A moment of reunion with somebody you haven't seen in years or months. Right? A gift that overwhelms your senses. The birth of a child. My daughter is six years old, and six years ago when she was born, our firstborn, everybody tells you what to expect, right? You get the, what's, the, what's that book? It, what to expect when you're expecting? Yeah. Useless piece of paper, useless. <laughs> you, nobody knows what to expect. Everybody says, oh, you, you won't understand until you get there. Yeah, sure, whatever, I got it. But I will tell you this, on her birthday, the day when she was born at Fairfax Hospital six years ago, she is born and she's screaming and crying and doesn't know what's going on. And she's there on that, that table where they weigh her and do all that kind of stuff they do. And I was standing there looking at her while Robin was recovering. And she grabbed my finger. Y'all, this is one of my favorite pictures I've ever seen in my life. The joy in that moment was indescribable. I don't know how to explain it other than to say if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. Stories, advice, books, promises, you won't know what to expect. None of it lives up to a moment like that. You see, we, we cook up these expectations in our brain and in our hearts of what we think was going to happen. But sometimes when that moment comes, the reality is so ridiculously more than what we could have imagined. We're left stunned, gobsmacked, blown away, no words for a moment. Our expectations have been totally thrown out of whack. We have been in this series in Advent. I know a lot of y'all haven't been here, but this series called The Heart That Grew Three Sizes and finding faith in the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas. And you want to talk about somebody whose expectations didn't match what happened? How about the Grinch? We left the Grinch last week at the tail end of this story about to push, y'all remember the story, y'all seen the story, right? Read the story? About to push the sleigh off the cliff, waiting to hear the cries of the, the who's and in whoville hear their cries of anguish and sadness, and then he was going to push it off and have some magical schadenfreude kind of moment, right? But in that moment, that moment of silence before he hears the singing in the valley below, his expectations of a Christmas destroyed, a Christmas stolen, are collapsed. His heart grows three sizes, and I, I promise you when we started this series that we were focusing on the book, have y'all seen the Jim Carrey version of this movie? A live action movie, right? I love that scene when he portrays lying on the ground. I'm feeling and I'm leaking. Like, that emotional overrun. I, I think what he was experiencing was realizing what joy is. Realizing that he had been so wrong all along. 
and overwhelmed with that joy in his heart when his heart grew three sizes. And here's the thing. It's not that our expectations are wrong, per se. It's not that the Grinch's expectations were wrong. If you think about it from a logical standpoint, we understand why the Grinch thought what was going to happen was going to happen. We understand why our expectations make sense to us. And in Scripture, we've been looking throughout the promises that Jesus, uh, the promises of the Messiah to come to the Israelites. And think about their expectations. We started the series in Genesis 12. God promising Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Your name will be great. Your descendants will outnumber the stars. And then we get the prophet Isaiah saying they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore places long devastated, renewing cities that have been devastated. We get Isaiah again in Isaiah 11 saying a shoot will come out of the stump of Jesse. A new king is coming. A king that is greater than anything you can imagine. And of course, Isaiah 9, one of the most beloved passages in the Christian faith. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And of the uh, greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. The prophecy in Micah, he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, and his greatness will reach to the end of the earth. And then finally, Psalm 72, the kings of Tarshish and distant shores will bring tribute. The kings will present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. I think we can understand where the Israelite expectations are coming from for a Messiah. Why they thought they were going to get a king on a white horse riding in to chuck Rome out and to establish a nation of Israel, reestablish a nation, and to take over and the world would bow down at their feet. Like, it makes sense, right? They have the line of Jesus from Abraham through Isaac to Joseph to Jacob to David through all the kings and then 500 more years. And they have all the prophets as well. Moses, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all promising this stuff. Put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites. It's pretty clear why they expected what they expected. What they didn't expect was a baby that would be born to a poor teenage mother in the backwoods of Israel. It's not that our expectations are wrong, per se. It's that what God promises is so great and is so full of grace and mercy and love that we can't even begin to anticipate it in our own way. And so as we look at our scripture this morning, we heard part of it earlier. It's a story of Mary and Elizabeth meeting together, a teenager who is in this situation we just can't even imagine, right? She goes to her family, she goes to a reunion with her cousin Elizabeth, who was barren, but who the angel had told Mary was with child. They go to the hill country of Israel. And what do we see? We see these two mothers-to-be gathered together. Now, I think it's important in this series, in this story, that we see Mary and Elizabeth for who they are, right? We don't see Mary and Elizabeth like this. Like, we hear Mary, what do we think? We think Virgin Mary, we think the the Vatican, the Pope, the, the Blessed Mary, all this glory and pomp and circumstance. But what we get is Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, in the backwood hill country of Judea. Two country folk, scared out of their wits, not knowing what was to come. We don't get glory in princes and princesses and castles. Think through this promise, to the, the promise of the people of the first century of Israel, and by extension to us, as we prepare for Christmas, ought to come off as some kind of theater of the absurd, right? You're expecting a king born of noble birth, ready to come and inherit power and seize back glory and honor and power for Israel, and you're a backwoods, poor, teenage mother. And God sends an angel and tells you, you are going to carry the child, the savior of all mankind. And you're pregnant. What do you do? You go and check on this thing that angel Gabriel told you. You go see your cousin, right? And she sees you and tells you that the baby in her womb kicked when she heard your voice. And then she pronounces this incredible blessing upon you. She says, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored? that the mother of my Lord would come to me. A blessing that Elizabeth could not possibly have come up with on her own because she knew nothing about Mary's situation. A blessing that only could have come from the Holy Spirit. Do y'all understand how ridiculous this is? Like, this is nuts. 
This is absolutely crazy. And then what does Mary do? What does Elizabeth do? They are so overcome with emotion. Do you know what they do? There's laughing, there's crying, and they sing a song. We get Mary's Magnificat. Mary's praise of God. We heard that this morning when we lit the candles. The only thing they can do is sing out of joy in response to what God has done for them. This is what it says. It says, and Mary said, this is her song, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. That's the beauty of Advent right there. The season of preparation leading up to Christmas without the run-up. If we skip right to Christmas, how many days till Christmas? Anybody know? Anybody? Six, right? How many of y'all are ready for Christmas? How many of y'all are excited for Christmas? Yeah. We can't jump straight to Christmas. If we jump straight to Christmas, it becomes exactly what the Grinch thought it was. It becomes a crass commercialization, a, a holiday tradition, not Christmas. Without the run-up, without the anticipation, the emotions, all the work, Christmas is just a commercial thing. And joy can't be our song. Joy will only be our song if we head into Christmas spending time in anticipation, recognizing the story of Mary and Elizabeth, the story of Jesus inbreaking into the world for what it really was, a shocking, jaw-dropping, incomprehensible moment for those who lived it. You see, the thing about Scripture is it can never mean for us what it didn't mean for them when it was given. And if it was incomprehensible and shocking and jaw-dropping to the first century people, then it ought to be incomprehensible, shocking, and jaw-dropping to us. We ought to look on it with that kind of awe and reverence and wonder. It's even more shocking than the way the Grinch story ends. Theodore Geisel, who wrote The Grinch, said it was the easiest story he ever wrote except for the ending. He couldn't figure out how to end it without it being crass or sounding like, I think his quote was a second-rate uh, sermon from a preacher. Right? It's a shocking ending to the story, but even more shocking is the way the Christmas story ends. Because to us, those promises we read through, those promises, they sound like personal victory, personal uh, renaissance, triumphing over enemies, tasting like sweet revenge. Look who's coming now. But it's reality, it's the story of God. The story of God humbling himself to be born in a manger, to leave the throne of heaven, to come down in the form of a vulnerable baby, born 90 miles from his home in a cold manger, coming not to judge the world, but to save the world, coming to reconcile the world to himself, coming to bear the pain of rejection, the pain of death, so that all of creation might be made right with God. Not to take the world by strength, but to take the world by love. Think about that this week. As we get the last six days to Christmas, think about that. Let's not skip ahead. Let's sit in that joy, that emotion, that anticipation, the tears, the laughs, the tunes of unspeakable joy around us. And may that be our song this Advent and this Christmas. I offer this to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.